everyone, welcome to this special special, a very short intro to GIS. I'm Shirley and my colleague is Elmer and we are from Coquitlam Public Library. Today we are glad to partner with Simon Fraser University Library Data Services team to jointly present this program. And we are glad and honored to have Sarah Zhang from Simon Fraser University Library to be our presenter today. So Sarah Zhang is the GIS map librarian and Simon Fraser University. She's passionate about providing learning opportunities for students, researchers, and the public to become not only consumers of geospatial data, but also producer and communicator of geospatial information and knowledge. She's an immigrant, a mother, and also a piano learner. So let's welcome Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. It's my pleasure to come here and talk to you about GS. So basically, I'm going to uh, show you how awesome GS is, OK? <laughs> so uh, Shirley, do you want me to uh, share my screen and start my presentation? Yes. OK. Does it come through? Yes. OK, great. OK, first, just to outline with what we are going to cover today. First, uh, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to uh, what is GIS and why is GIS useful. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about geospatial data because that's really essential to understanding GIS. Um, and uh, uh, I believe the best way to learn um, GS is to uh, is by doing it, not by listening to it, right? So uh, be prepared to get your hands dirty. Uh, we are going to use a data set from Coquitlam Open Data and uh, use that data to make a map to do a simple spatial analysis. Um, so hopefully from doing that, you will be able to understand the basic components of GIS and how you can think spatially. So first the thing first, what the heck is GIS, right? Um, I'm asking you this question, um, what things or words come to your mind when you hear this term GIS? Um, I'm going to give you um, my daughter's answer because I have two daughters. And uh, uh, where's my chat? Okay, here we go. My older one's answer is um, mom data boring. Apparently, she's sick of me talking about it all the time, as you can see. And my younger one, who's eight years old, her answer is joint illusion system. She's obsessed with op uh, optical illusion lately. So um, yeah, feel free to put your answer into the chat. What things or words come to your mind when you hear this word GIS? Geography, like GPS, but better. Nice. Data brought to life. I like that. Global information system. Satellite. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, I love your answers. Um, oh, there's one more where humans intersect with the environment. Yeah, totally. Yeah, some of your answers are totally um, to the point. Um, so hopefully by the end of my presentation, you can um, uh, grasp a better understanding of JS. But some of the answers are, uh, well, because you can see there's a wide variety of answers, right? People have so, um, different interpretation to what GS is. I think this exercise can totally um, illustrate that um, what an elusive term GS is, right? Um, so I'm going to show you two examples for GS. The first example is Google Maps. Um, so the 
important thing is to remember Google Maps is just is not just a map. You might be thinking, yeah, duh, obviously. But what I want to say is um, you don't use Google Maps the same way you use a print map, do you? What Google Maps uh, allows you to do is you can put in a starting point, you can put in an ending point, and Google tells you an optimal direction, right? So that's why you are not using a map. You are actually using a GIS that enables traffic and driving queries, right? Um, and the map is just an interface. So what's happening, uh, really happening here is there's a database behind it. And uh, uh, there's some analysis called routing analysis uh, running behind the scene. Another example I want to show you is um, a website, uh, a crowdsourcing website uh, that collects and analyzes uh, biking safety, risk, and crime data. Uh, I'm going to show you the website. So let me pull it up. Does it come through this web page? Okay, great. So this website has many data um, on many countries, um, but I've already zoomed in on Vancouver. And as you can see, there's many markers on this map, right? Uh, if you only see a number on some of the circles, that means you have to uh, zoom in a little bit further to see the individual markers. So each marker means um, there's a biking incident added by a user, right? So for example, if we click on this, uh, we can see that's an incident added by a user. Uh, this is another one. Uh, so it tells you what kind of incident it is, uh, one that happened, and just some details, right? Uh, an older man, but avid and strong cyclist hit the curb and fell from his bike. He ended up with quite a bit of trauma and had a heart attack as a result. Oh, and died. Oh, goodness, that's horrible. Um, but anyways, um, the reason I think um, this website represents a GIS um, is double-folded. There are two reasons. The first is, um, as you can see, uh, it organizes, it maintains, and it stores it stores a huge amount of data, right? Some user-generated data. Um, and uh, um, it all organizes this data in a geographic way because you can navigate and you can read people's biking experience um, on this map, right? You, you totally have that geographic context and geographic uh, reference on this map. Um, another reason, in addition to being able to view the data um, added by users, you will be able to view some visualizations. So in other words, um, there's some analysis running behind the scene. So let's take a look. Uh, I'm clicking on that visualization tab. Takes a minute to load. Okay, here we go. So um, we can zoom in a little bit. Uh, this is. Say we are um, interested in downtown Vancouver. Um, and as you can see, uh, as we zoom in, these uh, statistics on the right, it changes, right? Because it's co corresponding to the map extent we are seeing at the moment. Uh, so that's why they're changing. Um, let's zoom in a little bit further. Yep, I think this is good. So uh, what we are seeing right now is um, it's a, a heat map. Uh, the reason it's called heat map is um, it uses a crazy color, uh, rainbow color scheme. And also what well, these red areas means there are more stuff here, right? So in this case, it means there are more biking incidents happened in these areas. Um, you can even click on um, 
this graph uh, and to filter your data and this visualization to one type of incidents. So I clicked on collisions, right? So uh, you're only seeing the, um, the areas where biking collisions are most affected in downtown Vancouver, right? So that's another reason why we're using this, um, uh, we're, why we're using a GIS by using this website. Um, similarly, uh, similar to Google Maps, it, there is also an analysis running on the fly. Um, and that can give us some insight into the data, right? Okay, let me go back to uh, my slides. Okay, so we have seen two examples, and now let's try to define JS. Uh, what is JS? Is it a software? Is it hardware? Is it science? But the answer is it's all of the above and more. So one way to think of JS is it's a little like um, an ecosystem. Uh, as you can see on the right, this picture um, is a seashore ecosystem. So in this ecosystem, uh, we have coral reef, we have seagrass, we have some plants, but we also have water and land in this e ecosystem, right? All to uh, together, they uh, comprise this ecosystem. Likewise, for GIS, we have um, multiple elements. So we have data, we have software, we have hardware, we have um, even people and apps, maps and analysis, right? Together, all of those com uh, elements, uh, elements comprise GS. Um, and uh, uh, as, uh, yeah, I think one of your answers to my question, uh, what do what kind of things um, come to your mind when you hear this word GIS? Uh, some of you mentioned mapping, right? Um, many people think GIS is just about mapping on computers, which is untrue. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you why. Um, it's important to, there's a lot more to uh, GIS than just mapping. And it's important to understand that a GIS allows us to maintain, analyze, and share a wealth of data and information, usually in layers. Um, so this picture illustrates, um, so we have uh, a few different layers for different type of information. So we have one layer uh, for customer information, one layer for streets, one layer for parcels, one layer for uh, elevation and one for land use usage, right? So what's really cool about GS is it allows you to analyze data, uh, all of those data in different layers uh, in relation to one to another. So that's really um, powerful about GS and we are gonna see a little bit about this later uh, in the hands-on part. But why do you need that capability for? Why do you need to analyze um, data in different layers in relation to each other? Well, um, there are basically there are two reasons. Um, the first is um, by running these uh, analysis, they can help you answer some complicated questions because um, these ana uh, analysis can review insights into your data uh, and review some patterns into your data. Um, so like that example, bikemaps.org example shows us, um, you that website has so many incidents, right? And these incidents are observations. So you have so many observations, but what do you do with them? Well, by running that heat map, uh, heat, sorry, heat map, heat maps, um, you um, you can uh, get the, get some insights in, into the data, right? Because you can, it tells you the areas where uh, those biking incidents are most affected, 
right? So those hotspots are some patterns in that data. That is one reason. And uh, another reason is it can help um, make smarter decisions. So again, using that example, bikemaps.org, uh, um, we can imagine a government um, based on the information and the analysis um, can probably introduce some measures to reduce biking hazards and crime data, and crime issues, right? Uh, okay, so that is a super short intro to GIS, um, the, what it is and why it's useful. And uh, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about spatial data because that's a crucial part of GIS. Um, so what is spatial data? This is um, information on a spreadsheet. Um, does it contain spatial data? What do you think? Feel free to put your answer to the chat. Right, the answer is no, it's not spatial data because uh, it has three columns, right? And each column describe um, an attribute about some vehicles. So you have ID number, you have type of the, uh, of the vehicle, and you have some description for that vehicle, but there's no information about the location, right? So this data won't be able to answer some where questions. Where are uh, the vehicles in relation to each other? You won't be able to answer questions like that. By comparison, this is another spreadsheet. So uh, what do you think? Is this spatial data this time? Yes. Nice. Yeah, it is spatial data because geographic data represent spatial locations, um, right? You have latitude and longitude attached to these uh, vehicles. And also the spatial data is usually um, associated with some non-spatial data. So you, you still have those type and description and ID number for each vehicle, but you also have some spatial um, information attached to that, um, these attributes, right? So with this data, you'll be able to answer some uh, where question, where are those vehicles in, in relation to each other? Uh, spatial data comes in all types of, uh, all kinds of formats. Uh, you will encounter a lot of different formats like shapefile, like GeoJSON, like CSV, um, yeah, there's a, a lot, but fundamentally, there are only two types of spatial data. There are only two models that are uh, used to um, create spatial data. So one type is called vector data, and uh, um, it's discrete shapes with crisp boundaries. Um, and uh, um, Usually we use points, lines, and polygons to represent some features on the earth and on the map, right? So points can be uh, things like schools, hospitals, uh, street trees, or um, some other things. Uh, and lines can be streets, railways, pipelines, or whatever. Uh, and polygons could be like district boundaries, right? Um, by comparison, raster data is very different from vector data. Um, it, it usually um, represents um, continuous services with fuzzy boundaries. Uh, so it can best represent some natural phenomenon like precipitation, temperature, or elevation, right? Um, so examples could be aerial photography, satellite imagery, and uh, the um, digital elevation models. Um, and uh, um, the same location can be represented by either vector data or raster data. Um, it is possible, but just be aware that uh, there will be trade-offs for uh, both models. 
And just to think of, uh, you can just think of vector data and raster data as uh, Google Maps versus Google Earth, right? That's an easy way to um, understand the distinction. Okay, so that is the uh, theoretical part. Um, now it's time for the fun part. Uh, get ready to get our hands dirty. Uh, I'm going to um, open up a browser and go to a website called uh, ArcGIS.com. And we, we are going to use ArcGIS Online, which is a web-based uh, GIS application to do some mapping and GIS stuff, okay? Um, so hopefully you've already signed up for an ArcGIS Online account. If you haven't, it's fine. If you just want to uh, watch, um, that's perfectly fine. Um, you can probably follow along afterwards um, by watching the recording. But if you can, I'd, I'd encourage you to follow along. Okay. Just uh, bring up a browser and uh, um, I'm going to type in rts.com. Sign in. I'm using my credential. If you have any difficulty uh, navigating to the website or logging in uh, to the website, please let us know. Uh, you can um, put your question into the chat. Okay, so this is the home page once we are logged in. Uh, the tab we are going to use is map. So just to click on map. Okay, so uh, I'm going to give you a little tour to this interface. Uh, this is um, your canvas, your map canvas where you can add data, visualize data or analyze your data. Uh, so now we are seeing North America. Um, let's zoom in a little bit um, to Vancouver. You can just scroll your mouse or you can press shift key and draw, draw a rectangle. That is an easy way to um, zoom in. So this interface um, on the left, there are three uh, menus. Uh, one is details. Under details, you have about, content, and legend. So content is the one we are going to use um, frequently in this session. Uh, it just uh, shows you all the layers. Um, and add, that's uh, uh, what we are going to use later uh, when we are adding some data. And base map, so um, yeah, that's where you can change your base map. Uh, yeah, you can just play around with it and uh, uh, choose another base layer if you want to. For example, I'm choosing OpenStreetMap. And on your right, you have the save button uh, and the share because later you can share your uh, web map. Uh, you can measure your um, features on your map. So um, for example, if you click on that, you have three options. So first is area. You can um, draw an area and it tells you um, 
how much kilometers is the area, right? Or you can choose that one. Uh, that is for um, uh, distance, right? Just a draw uh, a starting point and ending point. Uh, that's 7.48 kilometers. Or you can use this one. So you can just click on um, somewhere on the map and it tells you the latitude and longitude. Let's um, add some data to our map canvas. Uh, I'm just going to uh, Google Oquilum open data. Yep, so that is the website. Uh, click on spatial data catalog. Okay, so as you can see, the city of Coquitlam, they have opened uh, a, a wide variety of data and make it accessible uh, for everyone to download and use. So they have uh, cadastral data, utility data, transportation data, environment data, planning data, parks data, and aerial imagery. Uh, we are going to use this data set, um, parks data, shapefile format, but you don't need to download it because I've already downloaded it and I put it on the ArcGIS server for you to use. So <clears throat> let's go back to ArcGIS Online and uh, uh, from this menu, add, click on it and choose add layer from web. Okay, just to leave this uh, option uh, ArcGIS Server Web Service as default, don't change it. And here the URL, um, you just need to copy and paste the URL I included in the handout. Uh, I'm not going to put it into the chat because no one's here. Uh, let me just uh, go. Um, grab the URL, that's it. Okay, and now uh, let's just um, click on add layer. Okay, great, it's loading. Uh, just to be clear, um, the reason I'm asking you to add data this way, add layer from web is because uh, this data set is too large to be, um, uh, to be uploaded directly to ArcGIS Online because we are using a free version of it. Uh, ArcGIS Online, they want you to um, use a paid version if you want to upload a larger uh, data set. Uh, but, if you, uh, but if you want to visualize a smaller data set um, that you found from this portal or some other government open portals, you should be able to uh, upload your data directly from your computer uh, to ArcGIS Online just by uh, choosing add and then add data from file. Okay, so now we are seeing two layers, right? Uh, under contents, uh, we are seeing two layers here. One layer is um, the parks in Coquitlam and another layer is uh, all the trees. So um, yeah, remember I was talking about layers, right? Each layer contains different types of uh, information. Uh, and for each layer, we can switch on and off of them. So for this session, we don't need this layer parks. So I'm just going to switch it off. Uh, we only need the trees layer. Okay, uh, now let's see um, how we can open up an attribute table for this layer. Under this trees layer, uh, you can see there are a few symbols um, beneath it, right? 
Uh, let's click on this table shaped icon and see what happens. There is a spreadsheet opens um, below the map, right? There are many rows of data here. So uh, what if we click on one of the rows? Uh, notice what happens. There is a box highlighted on your map, right? Uh, so let's zoom in um, a little bit to see uh, where it is. Okay, now um, as you can see, there is only one tree highlighted, right? So that means this row of data is linked to this feature. In other words, this tree on this map, right? And uh, uh, for this row of data, for this tree, there are a few columns, right? Um, and each column uh, or each attribute is used to describe some information uh, about this tree. So you have uh, an ID, uh, we have species, we have our plant area, and we have type of tree uh, to describe this tree. Right. Um, so this uh, actually brings up uh, a really important concept in GIS, which is um, attribute table. So um, attribute tables are made up of rows and columns that contain information relative to the different features in file. Right. Um, and I think now it's easier to understand there are three components of GIS. Um, there is a visual representation, there's, there's a relational database, uh, and there's uh, some spatial analysis tools. So uh, as we just saw, uh, those trees on the map, that is the visual representation, right? But behind it, there is a relational database um, and in this database, each row of data uh, is linked to a feature on your map. And each attribute or each column is about some information to describe that feature on um, the map, the visual representation, right? And on top of these two components, you also have um, some spatial analysis tools uh, for you to use. Uh, so that you can do some powerful um, uh, spatial analytical things. Okay, um, next let's see how we can symbolize your map. Okay, let's uh, go back to ArcGIS Online. Um, at this time, let's click on this icon, change style. The default is show location only. Um, and that is why uh, for each tree, um, the symbol is the same, right? Uh, they're all um, just some uh, small points, right? On this map to represent the trees. Uh, but we can actually use another attribute in this data to uh, symbolize our map. So uh, let's see. Um, what happens if we choose this attribute species? Let's click on that. And just click on then. Okay, let's zoom out a little bit. And see what we're seeing now. We are seeing a map that shows uh, different types of species of trees, right? Um, and if you click on legend, uh, you will get um, a clear idea of which uh, color uh, represent which type of species, right? Uh, each color represents a different species of tree. Okay. Um, but you can use another attribute to symbolize your map. Uh, as well. Let's take a look again, click on content and change style. Uh, what if we choose um, planted date? So let's pick that attribute. 
Um, and see, now it's suggesting you use uh, this continuous timeline um, and color to symbolize your map because ArcGIS Online is using some smart mapping uh, technology. So it can give you uh, some suggestions about symbolization. Yeah, let's just uh, um, use this one. And uh, uh, click on done. Then what happens? How do you interpret this map to find out um, what it means? We can click on legend. Okay, now we understand uh, the lighter uh, the shade, the older a tree is, right? And the darker color means uh, a tree is newer. But in my opinion, um, this is kind of counterintuitive. So let's see how we can change that. Again, click on content and click on change style. Okay, and uh, um, click on this one. So continuous uh, timeline color, click on options. Um, by the way, this continuous color um, as the name suggests, you are using continuous color to symbolize uh, the features on your map, right? Uh, so click on this options and uh, uh, we can just click on this invert and uh, click on OK. Now what happens? What we are seeing now? Click on legend. Okay, this is what I want. The darker the color, um, the older the tree is. Great. So to uh, summarize what we have done about symbolization, um, data can be um, symbolized in a, a, var a variety of ways. Um, as we have seen, uh, we can use a single color to symbolize our map. So initially our map just used a uh, single colored uh, points to represent the trees, right? Um, but we can also use um, a categorical symbols. So if we use that species to symbolize our map, um, we are uh, actually classifying the trees by their species name, right? So that is categorical symbols. Um, but we, uh, we can also use some continuous color to um, symbolize our map. So if we use that planted date to uh, symbolize our map, that is uh, actually graduate, not graduated because that is um, classified actually. Um, but uh, gradual symbols, right? So um, uh, all in all, data can be symbolized in a variety of ways. Okay, now let's see how we can do a really simple uh, spatial analysis. Um, so the challenge is how do we find all the Acer rom um, That's a Latin name. I, did, I didn't know what it means until I Googled it. It just means um, red maple. So how do we find all the red maple trees from our map? Let's go back to RGS Online. Okay, so how do we find all the red maple trees? Uh, again, let's click on content. And this time, let's click on this icon, filter. Okay, there is a dialog window pops up. So what we are um, doing now is um, we need to uh, tell the computer um, what kind of filter um, filtering uh, we need to do. So um, we need to pick an attribute first. What, which attribute do you think we should use? Yeah, it is species. Okay, and uh, then this from this, the second parameter, um, let's just choose is, and then um, 
yeah, we want to choose red maple trees, right? So uh, we can click on unique. That gives us all the values for this attribute. So if you um, scroll um, down on this drop down menu, you will see all the values for this for this uh, attribute. And where is Acer Rom Rom? Yeah, there it is. Okay. Now we have formulated, formulated this uh, equation to filter our data. We can just click on apply filter. And uh, ta-da. Great. Yeah, now we are only seeing all the red maple trees, right? That is a really simple um, spatial analysis. Um, theoretically, it is called query by attribute because um, map features uh, and their associated data can be retrieved via the query of attribute information within the data tables. So by uh, formulating that uh, equation, we are actually querying the database and retrieve the information we need, right? We only need all the red maple trees. Give me only that tree, that, uh, that type of trees. Okay, so uh, I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about uh, spatial analysis um, a little bit more. So uh, the basic question, um, yeah, I should say, well, spatial analysis can be used to answer uh, a lot of different questions, right? Uh, we just saw uh, it can be used to answer uh, some basic questions. Where are uh, red maple trees, are they spatially clustered in one area or dispersed, right? So uh, after uh, you're done with that uh, query by attribute analysis, you will be able to answer those questions. Those questions. Um, GS can be also used um, to answer some slightly more complicated questions. For example, where are the red maple trees within one kilometer of Monday Park? Then that is more complicated than uh, this um, simple question, where are red maple trees? Uh, let me go back to ArcGIS Online so that I can explain what that means. So um, to find out uh, where are um, the tree, red maple trees within one kilometer of Monday Park, you will need to do two uh, spatial analysis. One is um, buffer and another is um, intersection. So first you need to create a buffer, um, one kilometer buffer of Monday Park. Where's Monday Park on this map? Um, yeah, here it is, right? So you need to create a one kilometer buffer of this park. It's kind of, uh, once you are done with the analysis, it's kind of like a circle. Um, yeah, just a one kilometer of this park, right? It's a circle. Um, and the second step is you need to do a intersection analysis between two layers. One layer is this buffer, one kilometer buffer that you just created. And another layer is all the maple trees, right? Um, and then you do intersection analysis to find what is overlapping of these two layers of data. And then you will be able to find all the red maple trees within one kilometer of this park, right? Um, we are not going to do this uh, in this session, um, but if you're interested, you can just Google, how do I do um, creating buffer and intersection in GIS? And then you will find an answer. Um, by the way, ArcGIS Online, this free version won't allow you to do that analysis. Um, but you can use um, some other uh, desktop um, open source and free uh, GS applications um, to do that type of things. Um, for example, QGS would be a good option. 
Okay, let me go back to my slides. Okay, uh, but what we uh, what if we um, want to answer an extremely complicated question? Imagine that you are uh, a urban planner um, in the city of Coconut, and uh, um, there will be a real estate development near Mondi Park. And you were to decide which trees should be cut down. That is an incredibly, uh, incredibly um, complicated question, right? Um, because not only do you need to uh, do you need um, the data about the trees, you also need some other types of data, for example, infrastructure, traffic. Um, and transportation, right? Uh, you need all of those data and you need to look at all of those data all at once um, and do some analysis in order to answer um, this type of question. Okay, um, I think um, uh, that is the end of my uh, presentation, presentation, but uh, I hope by now, you um, get a clearer understanding of what GIS is and why it is powerful. Um, I think a, a way to describe uh, why GIS is powerful is um, it is the analytical power that allows you to uh, combine and analyze data in the ways that can answer questions and uh, um, uh, provide some new perspectives to some issues. That is the true power of GIS. That's it. Bye for now.